Hey, DM Dungo here with another review from the DMs Guild. This time we're looking at Mirrors of the Abyss by Ryan Durney and Christopher Rush. It's currently on sale for $16.99, although if you act quickly, you might be able to still get it in the DMs Guild sale for $14.44. What happens when you leave a fox god alone on the layer of the abyss with nothing but mirrors? Let's find out. So, Mirrors of the Abyss, what is this? This is a massive 266 page adventure designed for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition players of a party size from about 4 to 12 for tier 4 play, so that's levels 15 and beyond. The module listed at 15 to 17, but I imagine it would still challenge players at level 20. This is a seriously difficult dungeon in the same vein as Tomb of Horrors, and I tend to agree with the assessment of the Tomb of Horrors listed in the book itself from Gary Gygax and feel it apt to include it in my review. This is a thinking person's module. If your group is a hack and slay gathering, they will be unhappy. Brain work is good for all players. The real enjoyment of the Tomb of Horrors is managing to cope, and those players who manage to do so even semi-successfully will appreciate your refereeing properly and allowing them to live or die on their own. It is a killer. And this sentiment rings true for Mirrors of the Abyss. So now that the warning's out of the way, what's in the 266-page adventure? Contained within is a plethora of arts, handouts, maps, and diagrams of absolute gorgeous design and dedication, going, giving whatever Dungeon Master runs this everything they might need to truly wow their players. The book makes me believe that it's both art book and adventure, which isn't a bad thing at all. It uses a very different kind of formatting than most of the other DMs Guild's titles, but it explains how this formatting works, and everything is very detailed in terms of where monster stat blocks are, how they are different, what they look like, how the how the various um, things like read aloud text works, what's DM text, what different things mean, all of that stuff, that, that explanation is there, it makes it really nice and clear, and it's a very visual experience. At its core, the players are on a trail in the middle of a blizzard when they happen upon an inn, an inn that has recently had a new owner, a Shabala, a denizen of a place called Vulgara that resides within a layer of the abyss. She now makes this place her home and as such wields absolute power over it as she drags the players in and now they must escape or die trying. Doclations include trickery and traps, unique and interesting NPCs, combat and of course death. Being part of the Abyss, locations and their order are decided randomly, but there are a plethora of secrets to discover for your players, and much to discover even if they don't really know where they are going. Each of the locations the players visit is separated in town into chambers, with the order being done randomly. There are 20 main chambers, and there are additional ones that lead off from some of the existing ones depending on what players do. Finally, there is a confrontation with Ashabala herself, the results of which only the gods know. Now, what did I like about Mirrors of the Abyss? Well, the art, it is fantastic throughout and shows a real dedication to the craft. There's so much of it, in fact, that not a single page doesn't have some horrific demon or amazing landscape to look at or admire or feel disgusted by. I love the handouts that go along with all of them from songs, marks, books, maps, and coins. There are so many things to give players as a tactile experience. Obviously you're printing most of this stuff out, but you inventive players and inventive DMs can do some really clever stuff with just a bit of cardboard or some plasticine. I love the general tone of the adventure. It hits that note of Doom Party just right. You know that danger is right around every corner, and the next tile you step on could be your last. And at the same time, nothing feels cheap or unfair. Play smart and survive to see the dawn, attempt to hack and slash your way through though, and well, Leshebala could always use more servants. There are many interesting mechanics and components that you could probably run this once a year for a group of friends and it wouldn't be boring because of the random nature of so many of the puzzles and traps. Two of my favorites though are traps for Chamber 00 and Chamber 6. Chamber 0 I love because it has this potential for a slow burn trap, and these are kind of rare, only sprung at a very crucial moment. In the chamber you encounter two supposed brothers, each saying the other is a liar and that they have no brother at all. It's up to the players to decide who is telling the truth as one of the brothers must go with them for the party in order for them to proceed. 
There's so much here for a DVCM that I can't help but love it. And the location and which brother is which and which and and if either brother has a brother is all randomized. So it makes it really interesting. You players will be guessing as to which one's which and you roleplay them all accordingly, but it's just that little touch that I really like. As for Chamber 6, I love the visual here. It's such a unique thing. Essentially, party, the party find a porcelain with impression size just for them. Reminds me a bit about the manga about the holes. Anyway, um, once all the party is in, save one, the one remaining member must run a gauntlet of guillotine blades. Every time they make a mistake, that is, fail to move forward quickly enough or get hit by the blades, their allies move closer to a parallel wall with blades that, are three, that after three mistakes will turn them all into grated cheese. If you think about it like this, um, you've got a, a wall here with grates that have holes in it, and then there's another wall that's sliding down in front of them with spikes that come this way. So they slide across and all of a sudden you end up with a very uh, dead party. There are other chambers I loved, but I don't want to spoil any others further. The final thing I want to mention is how the final boss is handled. If the players are clever and have their wits about them, they can weaken and perhaps even defeat Eshevald. But it makes this fight incredibly tactical because of the great build-up for it. You know it's coming and you know you need to do something about it, but will it be enough? Now, on to what I didn't like. The monster stat blocks. This is one of those things that I have a chip on my shoulder about. Basically, I find the stat blocks both difficult to read and a bit confusing. Part of the reason for this is that the monster lists the proficiency bonus, but doesn't tell you what any creature is proficient in, so the stat blocks, while slightly compressed version, aren't technically complete. Every single monster in the adventure is unique, and while this can be a boon, is it will keep your players guessing as to what the abilities of the various denons and vulgara are, this isn't taking into account existing tool sets. It makes it extremely time consuming to port all of these over to monsters, and there are a lot of them. It may have been better to look at existing creatures in the monster manual and make notes of small adjustments if needed, and just reference them instead. This isn't so much a didn't like, but an observation. The verbose flag has been stuck on Max for this, and that's there is a lot, a plethora, a a, a Googleplex of information sitting on this adventure, and there's a lot to sift through. Most DMs will probably want to read through and pare it down to what they need, but on the flip side, at least everything you could need is there. In addition, a lot of the puzzles or traps can be extremely complicated. I recommend reading them a few times before running any of them to make sure you have a very firm grasp of understanding on how they work and how the players can work their way through them, which again isn't so much I didn't like, but just something to be aware of as a DM. This is a challenge both for the DM and the players, and it's supposed to be. It's designed that way. Now, for my final thoughts and my overall rating. So, bearing in mind everything that this adventure has to offer, what did I think overall? I don't think this adventure is for everyone. I think it caters to a very specific type of group and playstyle, but to that playstyle I think it caters to them very well. Sometimes it's better to be in a niche than it is to try to be all things for all people. This module fits that saying very well. If you are looking for a difficult thinking person's adventure, then you will love this if your DM is up to running it. As for my rating, I'm going to be using my perk system, so let's start with combat. Combat in this module is varied, interesting, and challenging as you would expect. Every monster is unique, and this in this pillar is only a good thing. The creatures have unique tactics and abilities and interesting ways of murdering the characters. In addition, the environments themselves are a hazard, meaning that it's more challenging, more tactical, and possibly you can use the environments to kill your enemies along with, along with them trying to kill you. It makes that combat just that much nicer. As I've said before, the final battle is part test of knowledge, part test of tactics, as Eshebala is not to be trifled with, and the fight is satisfying in its conclusion for this reason. Overall, I give combat a solid 5 out of 5. Roleplay is also in a good supply. There are a lot of interesting NPCs to encounter, coerce, bribe, and attempt to negotiate with. This holds true for both player and dungeon master, because nobody wants to have to sit there and, list and listen while your players argue about how to get by a specific trap. If you can interject a dungeon master's uh, like role-playing abilities and that kind of thing, that makes it much more inclusive. The dungeon master is a player, after all, in the same game. You're building the play you're playing the game together. 
And it does mean that good roleplay can easily be used to avoid several encounters and some very powerful creatures. I also particularly enjoy the hidden threat mechanics that the players never know if the ally they have temporarily gained might stab them in the back at an opportune time. So, 5 out of 5 here as well. Exploration. Now, you would think with an, uh, an adventure that's essentially a long string of dungeons, there wouldn't be much to do here. But I, there, it, you'd be wrong. There is a huge amount to explore and then find in this adventure, from secret doors to true names. There is so much to find and experience that players will probably never find all, find them all, which gives a strong showing from on an, an often underutilized pillar in D&D. Due to the nature of the adventure, some players may feel like this is a very straight shot with little room for branching, but each location has so much to look at and explore that I doubt any player will complain or find nothing to find. In fact, I find I would be very surprised if a player group found everything on a single playthrough, and there may even be too much to go through in any single play session with all 20 normal chambers. I would perhaps reduce this number to 10 to both increase replayability and shorten the play time to something more reasonable. While I'm on this, what would be really great is to include a table at the point where the multiple chambers occurs. Like right at the start, so you can see here is a list of chambers, and if you roll a d20, go to this page. Just be really nice to have. For this section, I'm going to rate it a 4 out of 5. It's not exactly perfect, because there could be some things improved. Removing the things I talked about earlier, though, the polish in this module is incredibly high. The sheer amount of art and the artistry on display makes this adventure part art book, in all honesty. Which isn't a bad thing, and I would love to see a hardback version at some point. In fact, it's even laid out such, though. In fact, that's part of one of the things that I think is slightly weird about it. When I open it in Adobe Acrobat, um, it has a little weird thing where there are a lot of pages that are double page spreads, and that's fine, except you have to re um, you have to configure Adobe Acrobat in order to use it properly in order so you can see the whole page at the same time. This makes it a little tricky for things like if you're trying to implement this into um, Roll20, or if you're just trying to read, like say, a map that spreads across two pages. You can do it, but it's not something that's completely intuitive to all people. So they might get a little like, why am I only seeing half of this, and then I have to as for my earlier points on monster stat blocks, this is a thing that is easily fixed, but there are so many monsters across the entire book that it might take a while and could annoy some DMs, particularly in the cases of things like grapple checks, that kind, that kind of thing matters. You need to know if a creature is proficient in athletics or not in order for you to figure out if what the DC is and all that kind of stuff. In addition to this, the formatting is easily explained but doesn't follow standard conventions from the other DM skills titles, so there could be some getting used to, but it isn't a terrible way to do things. It's very readable, but it's just jarring because it's very different. I want to point out this point how beautifully surreal some of the art is. I mean, just look at it. There is so there is such a high quality to it and really shows a lot of love and dedication. I've mentioned the author already, but all the glorious handouts and art that I would want to use and integrate into Roll20 is currently embedded inside the PDF, and, I'll cr and uh, several of these are cross double pages, which makes them basically impossible to integrate with any ease. Which isn't a deal breaker, but I always like to see it done separately so it's nice and easy to pop in. If the above tube issues can be sorted out, I would easily give this out a 5 out of 5. But as it stands, 3 out of 5 is the best I can do. My total score. My total score is a 4.1 out of 5 for the type of adventure it is, and I choose my words very carefully here. You will hate this adventure if you hate things like Tomb of Horrors. If you do not like snuff dungeons, where death is very likely, you're very attached to your characters, and you don't want them to see, to see them killed, don't run this. Pick a different module. Not every adventure is for all people, and I think that's okay. Overall though, the story, battle, and characters you meet in this adventure are incredible, and I think a group that likes this type of adventure will tell stories about it for years to come. So if you do love the Who Forest title dungeons, aren't terribly attached to your characters, and want a true challenge at a tier four adventure, what are you waiting for? And go pick this up right now. And don't forget to use my affiliate code. Thank you, that's been DM Dongo. Please do remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and please pick up Mirrors of the Abyss on the DM's Guild. Peace out.